On today's program, we'll discuss geographic illiteracy, how it affects lives in Indiana, hear a performance by the Ball State University Singers, and talk with the first white to receive the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Improving Race Relations. This week, November 15th through November 22nd, has been proclaimed by President Reagan as Geography Awareness Week. Dr. Michael Sullivan, Chairman of the Ball State University Department of Geography, will tell us how geographic illiteracy affects us. And how does it affect us? Well, it's interesting, Jim. Um, we read in the paper, and we're aware of how profoundly ignorant we are about place names. And so I'm sure we've all read about students who are unable to find Chicago. Or if you read the joint resolution in Congress, you'll read where 20% uh, of elementary school children located in the United States in Brazil, and so on. So when it comes to basic geographic information, we are profoundly ignorant, and that is a source of great shock and bewilderment. But the question I'd be concerned with is, what does it mean to be geographically illiterate? How does it affect us? I personally, as a geographer, am not as shocked by the fact that students can't locate Chicago or perhaps can't even locate Nicaragua, per se. But what I'm very concerned about is what that suggests, and that is if they can't locate these places, then what is it, what else is it that they do not know about those places? And that's what's very important, and that's what's missing. And in fact, one of my concerns about our, our uh, media kind of awareness of geographical literacy is that we are keying in on place name geography. And so we're really dealing with the symptom rather than the real problem. And I'm afraid that we might take an easy fix in that we will teach place name geography and therefore be able to locate the Chicago's and the Nicaragua's and so on and assume that we are geographically illiterate when we still won't be. And that's one of my real concerns. What is the problem? What, what is the basic problem? Well, as I see it, the problem is that, number one, geography as a discipline is not taught in elementary schools or secondary schools. At the elementary level, it is assumed to be part of what we would call social studies. And at the secondary level, for the most part, it's not taught at all, or if it is taught, it's taught as either a general science course or a general course for students who very definitely are not into, let's say, the college-bound track or uh, taking the more academic subjects. So, number one, it's not taught. Number two, when it is taught, more often than not, it's taught by a teacher who has not had any training in geography. So it's not taught well. So those are two of the major problems that we're dealing with here in terms of geographic illiteracy. And it's what we have to deal with also at the university level. And every evidence I have as an instructor of geography is that uh, students are indeed geographically illiterate both in the, let's say, traditional sense of place name, but more importantly in the sense of what it means to understand variations in environments and variations in culture and how those interact and interrelate. And that's really the essence of geography. And that's the part of geography that's never being taught. No, these places uh, affect your everyday life. Sure. They have uh, an interaction, as you say. Ab absolutely. Um, look at it on two levels, let's say. First of all, what does it mean to be geographically illiterate in an academic sense or in a, in a somewhat maybe theoretical sense? What does it suggest about our knowledge about other cultures and other places? What does it suggest about our knowledge of different physical environments in other places? What does it suggest about our knowledge of the interrelationships of those cultures and those physical environments? in other places. In all cases, it suggests that we don't know anything about culture. We know very little about different physical environments. We know very little about how those interact. Yet, as a country and as a people, we are intricately involved in various facets of those kinds of relationships. Case in point, let's look at, say, Nicaragua. Now, my question would be, how can an informed citizenry how can we, as a, a real democracy, if we make so much still academic and theoretical about it, how can we perform well if we are misinformed and uninformed about culture and physical environments in places like Nicaragua? How do we read a paper intelligently? How do we understand current events intelligently? Do these events impact on us? Well, Nicaragua is a good case in point. Do we really understand 
the physical environment of Nicaragua? Do we know what it means to be in, say, a tropical environment? Do we understand the, the limitations that a tropical environment creates in terms of, say, economic development, social development? Do we appreciate that? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. If we've not had geography, we probably do not. What does it mean in terms of understanding the culture that exists there? It's very important to understand that in the case of Nicaragua, for example, that that's a region settled by Iberian culture. And that's mixed with also a, a pre-Columbian culture, which is Indian predominantly. So the population and the culture that evolves there is very different from ours, very different from ours. They were not Anglo-Saxons. Their institutions are very different. It's Iberian, very, very different. If we don't understand that, then we have really some misunderstandings about expectations for that kind of culture. What do we know about the political geography of, say, Nicaragua or the region? We hear a lot being said about democracy and freedom-loving people. Now, those are attitudes and ideals that we hold dear, and they're part of our culture. And it's appropriate that during this period of the bicentennial celebration of the Constitution that we look at that. And one of the things that we discover is that our Constitution has evolved. It's an evolving document. Okay. But it doesn't necessarily follow that our precepts and understanding of, say, democracy or constitutional law are going to be the same in places like Nicaragua or El Salvador or elsewhere in the world. They're going to be shaped by the indigenous culture. And we have to understand that. That's one, been one of our big problems in foreign policy. Absolutely. absolutely. And one of my concerns, of course, is that we will assume what we do as citizens is we give up that responsibility and we give it to our political leaders, who in turn have not been trained or schooled in geography, and so also who may be uh, misinformed, uninformed, and you know, making policy or acting on policy with misinformation or the wrong assumptions and precepts, and it creates problems, it creates misunderstandings. So in that theoretical, academic sense, I think it's very, very important. Let's change the context a bit. Let's look at it in a more practical sense. If you're the mayor of Muncie, Indiana, you know full well that the running of the city of Muncie is very much a part of a larger world. When Mayor Kerry goes to Taiwan, for example, and, and there was some concern about that, what's the mayor doing in Taiwan, you know, another vacation or something, understand that 46% of the world's population presently lives in China, okay? And that population is continuing to grow between 2 to 3%. It's a rapidly growing population. Now, the kinds of goods we produce in the state of Indiana, in the city of Muncie, the kinds of commodities that we want to sell are in demand in that part of the world. We might call it the, the, uh, the Pacific Rim, as it's now called by geographers. And if we want to compete, if we want to create markets for our products, we've got to know something about the Taiwans of the world. And we have to know something about their cultures. And we have to be there. And we have to learn to market uh, our products, our, our advantages. And so we can't do that anymore from just Muncie. And what I said for Muncie is equally true for the state of Indiana. We are, we are tied to a large global economy. And I, I find it interesting, for example, we, at least I wake up in the morning and I have the news on, and one of the first reports I hear is the stock market report of Tokyo. Okay? We are a global society and we are tuned in to events in Hong Kong, Singapore, London, throughout. And it affects us in Indiana. It affects us in terms of jobs. It affects us in terms of attracting capital to Indiana. We have to be geographically literate if we're going to compete. At present, we aren't. So our problem is, one, uh, I think we, we don't realize that we're geographically illiterate, or two, we define illiteracy in terms of place names, so it's trivial. And so the point I would make is don't equate um, competency and uh, literacy with place name, but rather equate it with understanding cultures, understanding environments, understanding the interactions, understanding the interdependencies of societies at all levels with one another. That's what geographic literacy is about. Of course, if you understand uh, uh, these cultures, these place names fall in place. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So the place name doesn't become the goal. It kind of becomes what you learn in the process of learning something about cultures and environments and the interdependencies of societies. Well, I think that's very important. How do we accomplish this? Well, uh, what we're doing at Ball State University is uh, we've expanded the opportunity for students to study geography at the university level. Uh, and I think most significantly, we've added a course in the international global studies component of our general studies program. And geography is one of several courses that would be an option. I think that's important. That's an opportunity. So we're, we're dealing with it at that level. We're also dealing with it in the context of uh, 
creating, we have a, a state geographic society, all right, we call it GENIUS, the acronym for it, and it is attempting to work in close cooperation with the National Geographic Society uh, to establish uh, workshops and programs to train teachers to teach geography. But in answer to your question, basically and fundamentally, what we have to do, I think, is get the political leadership wherein the decision is made that geography must be taught, it must be taught well, and that's going to require political leadership. And we, and we work at it at the university level, we work at it in terms of professional organizations, but basically what we have to do, and we don't do this very well, frankly, is we have to gain political support. That's the way how, would, how would political support help you? Well, uh, it would be important in terms of, for example, having as a, a requirement of, say, maybe an elementary ed teacher to, as a requirement in their studies uh, for certification, state certification, to take a course in global geography. Presently, that is not required. Okay, I can teach in the public schools of Indiana and not take a social cultural geography course, ever. And yet, I can teach that course to my students, not ever having that background. And we'd like to see that changed, okay? Uh, and one of the ways to do that is to have that change come through those kinds of boards which mandate certification requirements and so on. So that's what I mean by political support. We do have, I'd say, Jim, we do have political support in terms of uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor at that level saying geography is important, we need to be aware of geography, we need to be aware of global interdependencies, and so on. But we need to get down to the real specifics of, okay, let's go from, from these declarations of importance to actual requirements. Let's, let's have people prepared and trained and so on. So it, it's difficult for us to do that. And that's where we need to work. Am I accurate in recalling uh, my school days, uh, elementary, uh, when we had geography classes and we were taught cultures and, and these related, uh, just the way you explained it, I, mm -hmm. can, I can recall. Uh, was there more emphasis uh, years ago on geography? Are we losing? I think probably that's absolutely correct. I think years ago there probably was more emphasis on geography, um, which raises an interesting question. Uh, are we less geographically literate today than we were, say, when you were a kid in the 1960s or whenever that was, Jim? Uh, and I, I don't know the answer. I honestly don't know the answer. Uh, tell you the truth, I'd hate to take a test. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm sure if teachers taught geography as you have explained it to us, it would be very interesting and more would want to learn it. Thank you very much, Jim. You're very kind. Thank you for being Thank with you. us. We've had as our guest on our program <clears throat> Dr. Michael Sullivan, who is chairman of the Ball State University Department of Geography. The Ball State University Singers, directed by Fritz Mountford, entertain now with a bright and lively dance number.
Grace Owens, a Pocatello, Idaho Spanish teacher, was on the Ball State University campus to discuss neo-Nazi groups in the Northwest and her opposition to them. Mrs. Owens was the first white awarded the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Award of the National Education Association. How are you going to talk to the Ball State two students about living King's dream and resisting the nightmare? In reference to what is the nightmare that you referred to? Well, I think that Dr. King's dream has been all but forgotten by many in America, including those at the highest levels of government. His dream was that we could all live together and that black children and white children alike could be judged on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And I think we've really forgotten that, in, particularly in a place like Pocatello, Idaho, people didn't know about the dream when it, when it was new. And people aren't learning about it now in the schools. And as a consequence, there's a real void. There's a real empty space there. When we have groups like the Aryan Nations coming in to fill that space, that to me then becomes the nightmare. In fact, we see some trends towards reversal of uh, the interest in King. For example, uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard in San Diego through referendum was just changed back to marketplace. And uh, a southwestern governor canceled the holiday that was given in his honor. Governor Meekham. Hmm? Beginning to be a trend towards that, is there not? Uh, do you see uh, an increase in, in uh, prejudice, racial prejudice particularly? I personally see a change. Um, all my life I've seen prejudice, but I had never confronted armed prejudice before. I had never met those with some submachine guns and weapons, uh, holsters, camouflage, bombs. I'd never seen that kind before in America. Um, I think there is a, a change. I think there is a trend. And I think that the leadership at the highest levels kind of sets the, the tone. Have you actually seen these people with these arms? Oh, yes. Why are they allowed to exist? I mean, submachine guns are outlawed. There's, there's a national federal law prohibiting the use of, of such weapons. Well, th we now have new legislation in Idaho which will take care of such groups, hopefully preventing um, the formation of paramilitary groups such as the Aryan Nations. But they had their own armed compound, and those in Coeur d'Alene, which is to the north, um, say that when the Aryans first came into the area in 1973, that they knew who they were and, and understood quite clearly what their goals were but that they felt that in a democracy they also had the right to exist. And so people backed off and there wasn't much attention given. Today, particularly because of the press, and I think that's to the press's credit, we're seeing a lot of publicity about them. We're actually seeing the small children being trained in the use of these weapons and people are understanding, I think, more clearly exactly what these people are about when we saw bombs going off in Coeur d'Alene last year, and when we saw a Roman Catholic priest's house destroyed with a bomb, then we realized that this wasn't something you just simply backed away from. These are things we usually associate with clan violence. Well, there's Catholic certainly a Jews. close connection between the clan and the Aryan nations. I don't think anyone would doubt that. Are they large in number? No, they're not. To our, our best of knowledge, there are very small groups in the North. Uh, I think that the danger comes in their amazing ability to network throughout the country. The Klan is certainly a beloved friend, um, and I think that that makes them much more dangerous for us because they can communicate so readily with others. You're very outspoken against these groups. That's true. As a matter of fact, you appear in, on the media, radio, uh, in answer to some of their programs that they have. Uh, have you ever felt personally threatened or have you been threatened for doing this? I think that I would choose to answer that with Martin Luther King's um, statement when he was 39 and he was asked about, about being outspoken and he, his life was certainly in danger at the time and he knew it. Um, he said that if a man lives to be 80 and lives that way in silence because he's afraid, then the cessation of breathing at 80 is simply a belated announcement of his death because he died at 39. 
And I think that I have no visions of martyrdom. That's certainly not what I aspire to. But I think that if you allow people such as the Aryan Nations or any other group to so intimidate you that you can't speak out, then you're falling into the, the very trap he talked about. Do you have as many supporters for your cause and belief as... Oh, many uh, more. Many more. Idaho is not a racist state. Pocatello is not a racist city. These people can be very violent. As a matter of fact, uh, weren't they accused of uh, shooting a disc jockey that uh, disagreed Helen with Berg. Mm -hmm. Why do they choose the Northwest? Idaho is a state with approximately a million people in the entire state. When we first moved there, statistics said that it was something like 26 square miles per person. And most of the people who live there are white. The Aryan's goal is to have an Aryan homeland, an all-white homeland. And so, in essence, they're going to the place where it will be easiest. They don't have to eject as many people if they go to an almost all-white situation right now. Do you think they're gaining any momentum? No, I don't think so. And due to opposition from people who don't uh, believe that? I think, I think basically that they've, in many ways, they've helped. In many ways, they have. They've, they've brought a lot of things to the light. They've, they've made people look into their hearts and look into their own language use and examine what they've been saying and doing for many years. Even people of goodwill who have used racial jokes, slurs, etc., without meaning really harm to others. They've made those kinds of people look into themselves and I, I think, while I certainly wouldn't want to go this route again simply to educate, I think it's been educational and I think it's been positive for the communities. You're the first white person to receive the Martin Luther King Award. That's what I'm told. I haven't been told that by any formal source, but people keep telling me that. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is for your work in, in trying to uh, create uh, racial justice and equality. Is that true? for the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're moving closer? Are we stagnant or are we reversing the trend? In the Pacific Northwest, I'm extremely hopeful, extremely. I think that wonderful things are happening. The, recently, we've formed a coalition um, against malicious harassment, and it's a five-state coalition with a very broad base of support support from education, from religious groups, from human rights groups, from labor. Um, and I see that as a really, really positive kind of thing to do at this point. Today we were talking here about what can be done in Muncie. And again, coalition building I think is crucial because one group can't address it. It can't always be human rights activists. It has to be everyone because I think the message just simply has to be taken into the churches and into the schools and into the government offices. We've seen in the past uh, when these people are not opposed or allowed to do their thing, they can take over a community and that's happened right here in Muncie, Indiana, where the Klan was at its strongest uh, during the 20s. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anyone on the civil rights front in the mold of Martin Luther King who has anything close to his charisma? our influence or who may have? That's a very hard question and I I, I suppose for me there will never be a, another Dr. Martin Luther King. I think that would be impossible. I think there are many who are carrying his message. I think that the charisma is lacking. I, I recently heard Hosea Williams and he was a dynamic speaker but he's not a king. He, he communicated the message and people were overwhelmed but there was, there was something lacking. The king only comes along once every several generations. One can hope for a more frequent <laughs> appearance, but he was a very special. He was sincere. At first, I found it hard to believe that a man who had been treated the way King had been treated, uh, put in prison, abused uh, physically and mentally, could really mean what he said, and, and over the years, I've become a believer that he did, that he was a great prophet. I think so. I, mm -hmm. I, I think there's no question. I think that if you remember back to the day that the four little girls were killed in the Sunday school and 
and he preached the sermon and, and all of the people in his church wore the little white crosses on their lapels saying, Father, forgive them. And that was his message, that as heinous a crime as it was, that they had to be forgiven and that love was the answer and that it was not hate. And I think he truly believed that. Not only in Idaho, this is the final question, but in other parts of the country, do you think these hate groups are on the decline? I think that they're becoming uh, more aware of means to communicate with one another. It's very hard for me to say whether they're on the decline or the incline. I think that's a difficult question. I'm not sure that I have any. I'm a Spanish high school teacher. I, <laughs> I, I don't have that kind of information. I'm not a professional by any means. Um, I think in many ways, perhaps they aren't on the decline. Um, they're setting up networks via computers and using modems, etc. But I, th I think that in a place like Idaho, um, and, and with the Klan as well, that legislation and courts have been able to put a kind of kibosh on them. They're, 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 they're suffering right now, economically and otherwise. And, and I think that's important. I think it's important to use the courts to our advantage as well. Um, all of the members of the order, the, the very militaristic segment of the Aryan nations are now either in prison or are dead. And that's really important. Uh, it makes most of us feel a little bit more comfortable. Yes, and of course an enlightened and diligent populace is very important too. Indeed.